uh, to Maggie McMillan, uh, who uh, joined us from, from, from the US. Could you uh, um, present your, uh, your presentation, uh, Maggie? Uh, sure. Hi. Um, I don't see my slides quite yet, but I, I will say that, Nick, you've gotten me quite worked up. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, I'm ready now to give a spirited discussion of some of my results. It's Fantastic. <laughs> I hope not in a bad way. <laughs> well, I'm glad I already have the money from you. Okay. So, um, and by the way, I, 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 I don't totally, I don't totally agree with Danny Roderick's recent uh, pessimism, and I also, I'm not sure that I've seen a lot of overvalued exchange rates in Africa. Anyway, so my my work focuses primarily on sub-Saharan Africa, and um, the slides I'm going to run through. Um, they're, they're less of an overview than sort of some of the results from the recent work I've been doing. Um, oh, I'm trying to, could, could we go to the second slide, please? I'm trying to, to change my own slides, but I realize I can't. So the main messages that I would like to get across to you today is that um, uh, contrary to uh, the results that were widely, um, that have been widely cited in Macmillan and Roderick uh, 2011, uh, if we dig a little bit deeper, we find that post-2000 structural change in sub-Saharan Africa has been growth enhancing, and I'll get into more of the details. Um, both commodity prices and governance have played an important role in facil facilitating structural change, and I know the Ethiopian leather sector, uh, leather industry, as, as an example where uh, prices of raw hides uh, were skyrocketing in China. There's been a lot of Chinese investment in the Ethiopian leather industry, they have a modern factor producing um, designer shoes. Um, then the three, apart from movement across sectors, um, some of my more recent work shows that there have been important shifts even within agriculture from self-employment to agricultural employee. And of course, there is a, a, a large uh, heterogeneity both across countries and across subpopulations within countries. So um, here there's a clear clear role for policy, um, both women and youth to be disadvantaged at the moment. And um, the, the final point is um, standard analyses of structural transformation, including my paper with Danny Roderick, have not included unemployment. And I know that can be uh, tricky to define in the context of uh, low-income countries in sub-Saharan Africa. However, it's a very important thing to take into account. Um, for example, if you have uh, increased female labor force participation, at least in the in the way that we know it, a movement from saying you're not working to working is an important structural transformation. In 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 much of Western Europe and in um, the United States, uh, where I've done some more some some research on this topic, the movement of a large numbers of people uh, into unemployment was a kind of structural transformation that was a huge drag on growth. So I think in low-income countries, we need to pay attention to this as well. Uh, moving on, please. Next slide, please, thanks. OK, so this, this just shows you that if you break out, um, um, the blue bars are the, the part of what's due to within sector productivity um, gains, and the red bars are the part of growth that's due to uh, structural transformation. So the movement of labor from low to high productivity sectors and vice versa. So if you look at 1990 to 1999, for the, for the uh, continent that I'm focusing on, sub-Saharan Africa, you see that structural change was growth reducing. On the other hand, if you look at uh, the, the, the graph from 2000 to 2010, you see that uh, almost half of Africa's most recent growth is, is a result of structural changes. And I believe that there are good reasons for this break in the series. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, this shows, this is a little bit of what uh, Nick was talking about here. This is for all the countries in this, this is a relatively small sample, I should say, of uh, 12 countries. Um, there has, the, the bottom, uh, axis shows uh, changes in employment shares, and we see that there have been, and, and the vertical axis shows uh, labor productivity or output per worker relative, um, sorry, output per worker, um, and uh, the size of the circle is the, the employment share. So you do see a large shift out of agriculture, so roughly a four percentage point decline in um, 
employment shares in agriculture and a correspondingly almost four percentage uh, point increase in, in the size of the service sector. But there is also a small increase in the size of the manufacturing sector and both services and manufacturing are more productive than agriculture on average. Moving forward, please, with the next slide. Um, but um, but uh, so I have stories to, to, um, to, to back this up, but what I think is happening is during the 1990s, uh, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa were still going through a process of, uh, process of structural adjustment. And, and I suppose that uh, to this audience, I don't need to make this point so much, but um, to some audiences, it, you know, you really need to hammer home the fact that the African countries as we know them today are still so relatively young. So um, in the 1990s, um, Zambia is a great example. We had the, a dismantling of the um, copper, uh, public um, institutions in the copper sector, a lot of uh, shedding of employment, movement out of industry and back to agriculture. But as these things uh, solidified, you see in, from 2000 onward, um, a movement back into uh, other sectors of the economy. Um, and um, we also see a strong increase in commodity prices, 2000 to 2010, fewer civil wars and political change. So let me move to the next slide. So this shows um, from, two, this is, um, these are country weighted averages of commodity prices by country. The countries are at the bottom. It's too small for you to see, but the point is we have a relatively, th these are countries for which I have um, a sample of data for which I'm gonna talk about later, but you see that from 2000 onwards, yes, there was a spike in commodity prices. It's not limited. It's both agriculture and non-agriculture. And, and they're higher than they've ever been in Africa's recent history. Keep going, please. And th this is also very interesting. You see huge improvements in governance across African countries. The reason for all the different colored lines is that we wanted to make sure that we weren't capturing some trend that was um, generated by the inclusion of a few specific countries at the very end of our sample. So, and, and what you can see is that all the various colors fo follow a more or less similar pattern and that between 1990 and 2000, but even between 2000 and 2010, govern governance indicators on average have picked up um, so I don't, I, I think institutions are changing and for the better. Uh, keep going, please. Next slide. And then this is a, this is taken from a paper by somebody named Scott Strauss, by a, a political science, a scientist named Scott Strauss. But you also see um, from 1990 onwards, uh, a decline in the average number of armed conflicts in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, next slide, please. So, so you know we've done we've done what we can with um, the macro data to a large degree, um, and it's tough because we we pulled together data sets, labor force surveys from lots of different countries, and um, you know we're not sure whether they were uh, the questions were the questions aren't always comparable, and seasonality isn't always taken into account. So, so there. Are, questions remain about um, the quality of the data. And um, so, so to get at this, um, to dig a bit deeper, I've been using the demographic and health surveys um, that are collected by uh, the US government in several low income countries. And the advantage, so they, the, the, the advantage to using these data is they have very rich detailed information on occupation by gender. They're nationally representative surveys. Uh, we aggregated occupations into self-employed in agriculture, agricultural employee, sales, clerical and services, professional, skilled and unskilled manual, and unemployed. Um, I, I mentioned the quality. Um, we can distinguish between rural and urban. We can distinguish gender, youth, and for women, we have a whole host of factors that can explain uh, labor force participation, such as whether the woman is pregnant or has given birth in the past uh, six months and so forth. And so uh, I'm currently using these data 
to, I, to try to understand the extent to which growth has been inclusive and the relative importance of commodity prices, politics, and other determinants of structural change. Now, we can go back after we do this exercise, we can go, we can go back and construct measures of well-being uh, based on uh, the sector in which you are employed, um, but we haven't done that yet. So uh, next slide, please. So this is just a map to show you how um, how great the coverage is for low-income countries. If you look at sub-Saharan, the darker the color, the more say years we have available. But there, there are very little data sources that have this this degree of coverage of low-income countries and. Um, even employment shares, I've written this down in a paper, even if you look at the world development indicators of the World Bank, there are only seven countries in sub-Saharan Africa for which you can break down employment into manufacturing, services, and agriculture. And even some of those data, like the data for Botswana that I know intimately, are questionable. They're, they're, not, they're not correct. So the, the data problem cannot be underestimated. So, uh, next slide, please. So I hope you don't mind, gosh, I don't know if you all can read this, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for the kind of results that we're, we're finding here. So, um, so a, um, each column rep represents um, a, different, um, a different occupation. So uh, the first, so let me, let me talk about the first column for a second. How many minutes do I have? Zero, maybe. Uh, um, two. <laughs> So, so in the first column, for example, I'm looking at the probability that a, a, a respondent um, says that they're employed in agriculture. And um, less education means you're more likely. If you're young, you're less likely. If you're urban, you're much less likely. If you're female, you're much less likely. But if you look at, for example, um, GDP per capita, um, increases in growth over time are associated with increased agricultural employment, which may seem counterintuitive. But if you look at the next two columns, you see that the increases in growth are associated with reductions in self-employment in agriculture. And then the third column shows us that GDP growth is associated with um, increases in being, being an agricultural employee, so being a salaried, a, a paid worker in agriculture. And just going across the GDP column for a second, uh, increases in growth are associated with increases in uh, professional employment, reductions in service sector employment, increases in skilled and unskilled manual uh, sector employment, and reductions in the shape of course not working. The, I know that the, the coefficient on the services sector um, is confusing because we do see we have seen a big increase in the, in, the, in the share in the size of the service sector, but it turns out that if you disaggregate it by men and women, they go in opposite directions. Uh, next next slide, please. So I just um, I just want to highlight one more thing that we're able to do with these data, which which is for 25 countries, we're able to look at these results um, across uh, country by country because we have sufficient data. So what I'm doing here is I'm I'm showing. So for example, in Ethiopia, um, if you look at just the column where it shows the last year, you see that um, and this is self in employment and agriculture, there's been an increase in the share of women self-employed in agriculture, but no change in the share of, in, the, in the probability of a man being self-employed in agriculture. And that's between 2000 and 2011. On the other hand, if you go to the bottom of the table in Uganda, you see that uh, increases in growth have been associated with reductions in both men and women saying they're working, they're self-employed in agriculture. And that's for the years 95 to 2011. So there's very much uh, a cross-country heterogeneity that we're able to get it with these rich data. Next slide, please. So the pre preliminary results using these data are just that the broad, the broad patterns are consistent with the macro data, with the finding that in the later years, um, we're seeing um, some positive structural change. Um, uh, and and uh, Moreover, growth appears to be inclusive in so much as it, as it has, I didn't show you this, but it has quantitatively more important positive effects in rural areas. Um, and that 
Um, for example, women are much more likely to be unemployed and much less likely to be employed in agriculture, and youth are much more likely to be unemployed across the board, but the problem is more severe in urban areas. I think this is my last slide. I'm sorry, I didn't, um, I don't have a wrap-up slide, but if you go back to the main messages, um, the main messages are, are based on what I've just gone through. Very good, Maggie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so there has been a structural change in, uh, in African countries, at least the sample that you looked at, and uh, uh, it's been growth enhancing and there's also been productivity change. Uh, so a uh, relatively positive story. Um, I think we now move mm -hmm. to, uh, to Anders Dutoy to toy for uh, maybe a, a, more, a more negative story about when tr structural transformation doesn't happen. 